Hello, I'm King County Prosecuting Attorney Dan Satterberg. Welcome to another edition of The Prosecutor's Partners. Today we're going to focus on juvenile justice. You know, we're learning a lot about the development of the juvenile brain. It's actually a process that goes from birth to about age 25. And what does that mean when we understand that the juveniles think differently than adults? We'll talk about how the courts have accepted the science and changed their attitudes, and more importantly, about the programs that we're working in connection with the community on to help young people who stumble and get in trouble with the law use that as a teachable moment instead of a ticket to the courtroom. We all want a community that is a safe place for our families to grow up and a safe place for our kids to grow up. What we're learning about juveniles now has informed our approach to keeping kids out of court and out of jail and away from the criminal justice system. It's important to look first at what sociologists call the age crime curve, and it tells us, I think, what we already know. 60% of serious crime are committed by people under the age of 30. The peak of that time and the drop in the committing of crime coincides with what we've learned about the development of the teenage brain. This slide shows you a brain scan of a typical developing teenage brain. What we have found is over the years through adolescence that the teenage brain is still developing, actually all the way up to age 25. And what science tells us is that the teenage brain is different from the adult brain. Teenagers are sensation seekers. They're impulsive. They do things without regard to whatever the consequences might be, and they're much more easily influenced by their peers. Teenagers are not just little adults, they are unique creatures in and of themselves. Now, if some of us didn't need brain scans to convince us of that, because we know that teenagers are the only ones who ride skateboards. Skateboards are ridden by people who are sensation seekers, who are subject to peer influence, and who have no regard for consequences. Very few adults ride skateboards. Another way that it was explained to me by a neuroscientist from Yale was this, because I'm an old Star Trek fan. She said, well, you know, in a teenager's brain, there's the prefrontal cortex. That's the voice of reason, the logic. That's Mr. Spock, the brain's CEO. Now, battling during the time of brain development is the limbic system. That's the brain's emotional center. It's always on the lookout for threats and rewards. It's the sensation seeker. It's the Captain Kirk. It wants to fight with the Klingons. It wants to drive the Enterprise too fast, despite the lack of dilithium crystals. It wants to kiss the women. It wants to do risky things without regard to consequences. So when you look at your teenager, just know that this is going on inside their brain the entire time that they're growing up. Mr. Spock is battling with Captain Kirk, and it isn't till about age 25 that the logical Mr. Spock CEO of the brain starts to win this battle. So what do we do with this? If we believe that teenagers are different and if their brains are not fully considering the consequences of their acts? Well, over time, the courts in the United States and in the state of Washington have begun to accept this fact. And they've done some things to consider that we should be treating juveniles differently. Starting with a series of cases back in 2005, the court has found that juveniles should not face the death penalty, that juveniles should not face a life sentence for a violent crime. In 2012, the, the court found that children are constitutionally different from adults for purposes of sentencing, and that juveniles who have been sentenced to a life sentence for a crime they committed before 18 had to be resentenced. More recently, in the state of Washington, the state Supreme Court held that trial courts have to consider the mitigating qualities of youth at sentence, and actually that the, the state sentencing guidelines don't apply to crimes committed by a person under the age of 18, that the judge is free to consider any other sentence because of brain development. And the legislature had to, because of the United States Supreme Court case in Marilla versus Alabama, go back and order the resentencing of defendants who committed serious violent crimes before the age of 18 and got sentences of more than 20 years. Each of those people going back as far as we can go back will have the ability to appear before the state's parole board and have the parole board release them if they have served 20 years. So the jurisprudence has caught up with the science. Courts are recognizing that 
even when juveniles commit serious violent crimes, that we have to treat them differently than we do adults. But what about the average typical juvenile crime? Not the violent crime, but the stupid thing, the misdemeanor, the shoplift, vandalism, the assault, a simple assault, pushing, shoving, whatever might get them in trouble at school or might get them in trouble uh, with the law. We developed a program called the 180 program seven years ago. And it is a community partnership where communities have come together to help us raise our children together and to take that moment when they had a brush with the law and turn it into a teachable and inspirational experience as opposed to a trip to the courtroom. You see, when kids go to the courtroom, they're given a public defender, they're given a trial date. That trial date might be continued for up to a year before disposition. And most importantly, the youth is told to not talk. You have the right to remain silent. Let your lawyer do your talking for you. Well, the 180 program is a 180 from the courtroom. Here, youth are engaged by caring members of the community who, first of all, tell the kids that they love them and they want them to succeed and they believe in their future. In the 180 program, we don't talk about what the kid did, but we talk about what the youth wants to do with their life. It's aspirational, it's motivational, and the 180 team, which is a community-based program, has developed all sorts of new ways to plug kids into positive programming after the 180 workshop. If they go to the workshop, which we hold once a month at the Seattle University Law School, they go to that program, lasts about four hours, and they start to engage with the community leaders. Well, we'll agree to not file that case ever so the kid can avoid having a criminal record. You know, We've had more than 2,000 teens go through the 180 program since 2011. Imagine if you're a parent and you call 911 because you're afraid of your child. Your child has assaulted you, or your child is assaulting their siblings, or destroying the house. You have to call 911 because you're afraid of your child. What happens is that parents want help at that point. But over the years, we have been slow to provide that help. Today, in King County, we have a program called FERS, or Family Intervention Restorative Services. Yes, when 911 is called, the police officers will show up. And if the child is over 16, there is a mandatory arrest law for domestic violence in our state. But rather than booking that child into detention, a child is taken to this room up at the juvenile court courthouse. It doesn't look like a jail cell. It's still a serious matter, and the youth has been removed from their home. But now they're surrounded by people who want to help that child and that family, those parents, learn to live together. We have a program called Step Up in King County, which is a family mediation program. And it used to only be available when a youth had been convicted of that domestic violence crime. Often that took months. And we were asking parents to drive their kids to court to testify against their kids, to get a conviction on their record, so that then we could provide family mediation services. Well, under the FERS program, we can skip all of that due process step, which many of the parents didn't want. They wanted help when they called 911. Today, under the FERS program, we offer help within 24 hours. If the youth and the parents agree to go into the Step Up program and, and engage in other services available through FERS, then we'll agree not to file that case. The FERS program responds to the impulsive teenage brain, as well as the parents' need for some help in raising kids. We have another program in King County that utilizes the artistic and motivational skills of so many of our wonderful artists in town. The Creative Justice Program, on a quarterly basis, receives a dozen cases of young people from the juvenile court and works with them over a several month period of time. These artists become mentors, they teach kids how to express what's inside them, whether it's writing or spoken word poetry or music, other performances. For a whole quarter, the youth are paired with the mentor artists, and then at the end of that period of time, they put on a performance or an exhibition. It teaches kids confidence, it builds connections and relationships between positive adult role models and youth who might not have that in their life. The Creative Justice Program is funded by the Four Culture Program of King County. When we look at juvenile justice in King County, it's remarkable to look at the progress that we've made in the last 20 years. 
These two charts show you referrals, which means cases brought to the prosecutor by police, and filings, which means cases that the prosecutor has filed in court. It shows that since 1996, referrals are down 77%, and filings in juvenile court are down an astonishing 85%. We have fewer and fewer cases in court, and we are looking for community alternatives to keep kids out of court and out of a path toward a lifetime involvement in the criminal justice system. The detention center in King County in 1996 had almost 200 people on an average day. Today, we have about 50 or fewer. Again, we know that detaining children uh, is, can be very harmful to their progress and to their learning and can begin a, a long slide into criminality. There are always going to be need to have some kids in detention. When they commit serious violent crimes and they've committed harm to people, they're going to be in detention. But we make sure in King County that only the most serious offenses are treated with captivity. One of my great concerns about juvenile crime in King County are kids with guns. Remember back to the, the slide about the juvenile brain, that we know that kids are impulsive and that they are out to impress their friends and that they don't consider consequences, they're sensation seekers. These are all the reasons that you don't want a kid to carry a gun. In Washington State, it's a felony for someone under the age of 18 to have a handgun. And in King County last year, we had 36 kids who had never been arrested for anything until they were arrested for what we call unlawful possession of a firearm, or an OOPFA. We looked at those cases a year later of those 36 kids. Two of them had ended up being killed in gun violence. And three of them today are facing long, prison sentences for adult crimes that they committed with guns. Clearly their arrest and their treatment within the criminal justice system did not stop their desire to have a gun and to commit crimes with guns. This is an issue that the entire community needs to come together to solve. One of the ways the community has stepped up with a new approach is through a restorative justice process that involves what's called peacemaking. Now, I'd never heard of this a couple of years ago, but community leaders came to us and said, let us try this process where we can sit with a youth, we can invite the victim to be part of this, we can sit with the family in an inclusive process that involves many of the tenants that were taken from the Indian tribes of Canada. There's a ceremony at the beginning, there are objects in the middle of the circle, there is a talking piece. And when a person has the talking piece, the other people in the circle have to listen. This, again, is to be contrasted with what happens in court, where we tell the young person to not say anything at all. What we really need to do to engage a young person and to make a connection with them is to encourage them to talk. And that's what the Peacemaking Project does. This young man, his name is Ramon, got in trouble one day for a very stupid and impulsive act where he went to buy some tennis shoes from another youth who he went to school with, he knew his name, and at one point pulled out an air pistol and robbed the, his classmate of his shoes. Within a half hour, Ramon was under arrest and in handcuffs and was facing two years in prison for first degree robbery. The community came to us and said, let us work with this young man and his mother and their siblings they were about to get evicted from public housing because that's what happens when a felony charge has been levied. And the community group worked with, to keep them in public housing and to work with this young man. He apologized to the victim. He got back in school. He's graduated from high school and heading to college now. It's a remarkable story of what can happen when a community comes together. They worked with Ramon and his mom and their family on not just the peacemaking circle process, but on shoring up the rest of the part of their lives that was in chaos. The community rallied together, came to the court. We had 200 people show up for the sentencing of this young man. This is the leader of the Peacemaking Circle process in King County. His name is Sarom Fong. He has taught us all about what can happen when we spend time with young people who have felt like they are not worth anything. They're not worthy of help, and we offer to help them. The Peacemaking Circle process is still new to King County, but we have other cases that we're experimenting with. The community has stepped up and said, as part of a community justice approach, let us help our children get past the difficult times 
and the difficult mistakes that they've made. It holds great promise, I believe, to address some of the core issues that underlie youth violence in our community. So how are we paying for all these things? Well, we're lucky here in King County. We have a couple pots of money that make us the envy of many jurisdictions. Back in 2008, a one-tenth of one percent sales tax was passed. It's called the Mental Illness Drug Dependency Tax. It helps us pay for a lot of the programs that we're using, the LEAD program in, uh, in drug addiction and the, the Crisis Solution Center dealing with people with mental illness. And we also have a program that was passed, a property tax levy called Best Starts for Kids. Between the two of these programs, we have access to over $120 million of money that we can use to pay the community for providing solutions to complex social problems that end up on the doorstep of the courthouse. So fundamentally, I believe that to reach a young person and to reach a person with mental illness and drug dependency, that we really have to look at them as a whole person and use what we know to use our shared humanity in this approach. And for me, it's simply this, that to change the way that we act, we must change the way that we think. And in order to affect the head, you have to start with the heart. You have to start with a connection to a person who has been told that they're not worthy. You have to start with trying to raise up somebody who's only been pushed down and have the community rally together to create a just and safe and holistically healthy community for all of us. It's criminal justice and it's community justice. Juvenile brain development science has told us a lot that we already knew about kids. They're not just little adults. They think differently. They act differently. And the court system has begun to accept that they should be treated differently. Some of the innovative programs that we're doing here in, in King County involve the community stepping up to help raise our kids together. This is the best way for us to make sure that kids are not involved in the criminal justice system. At the end, it makes us all safer, it helps the kids reclaim a future, and it saves taxpayer money. Those are some of the things that we're doing here in King County, Washington. I'm Dan Satterberg, King County Prosecuting Attorney. We'll see you again.